ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದ ಗಾವೋ ದೋಗ್ಧಾಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ as we continue with lecture 22 of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita lecture series as we continue into chapter 7 shri krishna bhagwan is going to tell arjun about four different types of devotees he says chatur vidha bhajante mam janah sukruti norjuna arto jignasu artharthi gnani cha bharatarshaba guru mahan swami maharaj gives an amazing commentary on this one couplet. He says, imagine there's the king of the entire country. The king has four children. All four kids have the same parents. But they all understand him differently. In the same way, God is everyone's parent. Everyone who is described here are God's children. Four kids with the same parent. They have the same conviction that their father is God. However, each of them understands God to be something different. For example, even if there's a kid whose father is the king, he may still cry for a toy, not understanding that his father can actually give him the entire kingdom and everything in the land. He doesn't understand who his father truly is. But there is a wise child amongst the four of them who truly understands who his father is. In the same way, four types of devotees. Three of them don't truly understand who God is. but the wise devotee understands god to truly be god if we go into who these four types of devotees are the first is the arth devotee this is someone who's distressed these are people who are experiencing some sort of pain and suffering either at a physical or at a mental level they're upset with their lives and they want something to improve and they need someone or something somehow they need to get help they'll take help from anyone and usually when no one else can help them anymore they turn to god at the end the common example for this given by most acharyas is dropadi during the time when she was being disrobed she turned to god at the very end until she was out of options she had no need for god she didn't even remember him he was a spare wheel to her the second type of devotee is the arth arthi someone with desires These devotees approach God with the desire of some sort of material wealth, name or fame. Although their devotion is for wealth or a specific desire, they're also termed devotees because they're linked to God. The prominent example of this is given from the Srimad Bhagavat is Dhruvji. Many of us feel that most devotees must be in the first category. It's not like that. Most devotees actually fall into this, the second category. It's not that we lack something, we just want more. You'll see that in the mandir, the mandir is always packed with more people right before exams. People are constantly praying for the next thing that they want in life. It's not a need, but they just want something more. I want admission to this school, and then I want this job, then I want to marry this person, then I want to have this type of child, and I want to live in this type of house, in this type of city, I want to have this type of car, I want this type of vacation. We're offering our God some form of devotion in exchange for God fulfilling our desires. The third type of devotee described here is the jignasu someone who's curious someone seeking knowledge these devotees also have faith but are just generally curious to know more they're not necessarily invested in applying that knowledge into their lives making it into wisdom making it practical these people read the scriptures and then write essays how to learn xyz topic from the bhagavad gita That topic isn't how to build a connection with God, it's something else. And in doing so, they want to impress people. And by impressing people, they feel satisfied. Like how some people may read history books on past civilizations solely because it interests them and it makes them feel interesting. At one point in his spiritual journey, Uddhavji was considered this category of devotee a jignasu. And the last category is a gnani, someone who's wise. someone who's self-realized these are the devotees who have fully realized that god is god they understand what that means and they're content upon just having attained god they desire nothing else from this world or the next world they don't even pray to go to heaven why would they pray if they realize that they have god in this life 
then what's the difference between this life here and heaven? The only difference is death. Of the four types of devotees, three of them are only using God as a medium for what they want. And the first two don't even believe what God is telling them. Bhagwan is telling them that the world is false and the soul is real. But the first two categories, those devotees believe that the world is real and that they are the body. And that's why they want some happiness or protection for their body. The third is merely curious, interested in using God and His words to better understand something about the world. He's just curious to learn something new. And the fourth, the fourth devotee is here only for God and that's why he or she is the best. This category of devotee is based not on what we are currently but what we want. We don't have to become a gnani, a wise person after doing spiritual sadhana. We can choose to become one right now. And then Bhagwan Sri Krishna tells Arjun that Bhagwan is compassionate towards all types of devotees. Udaraha sarva eva ete. But it's important for us to remember that what you want defines what you are. Your state of enlightenment is not based solely on your actual current state, but on what you want from God. If you want nothing else than to just enjoy being near God, having attained God right now, automatically you become a wise devotee. And that gnani, that wise devotee has full love and devotion towards God. It's not just dry, unattached wisdom. That's why in the very next couple, Shri Krishna Bhagavan tells Arjun, Tesham gnani nitya yukta eka bhaktir vishishyate. Until now, we've talked about gnan yog, bhakti yog, karma yog. Remember, the common denominator amongst all three things is yog. These are different paths according to our inclinations, but they're all linked. If you have gnan, wisdom, then naturally you're going to have pure devotion towards God because you understand who God is. They're not separable. They're inseparable from each other. And then Sri Krishna Bhagavan tells Arjun, Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta Shraddhaya architum ichchati Tasya tasya chalam shraddham Tameva vidadami aham Krishna Bhagavan is telling him, Me, I am God. And what do I do? In whatever God people have faith in. Not just you, Arjun. In whatever God people have faith in, in the end, that faith is coming from God Himself. Again, this shlok reminds us that there is only one God. In all devotion, in all religions, in whatever God we worship, that faith comes from God and that devotion reaches that one Parabrahm Paramatma, Sarva Deva Namaskaram Keshavam Pratigachati. No matter who you worship, it all reaches one God. And now, towards the end of chapter 7, Bhagwan tells Arjun about Brahma. Now we're going to enter into chapter 8. Closing chapter 7, Sri Krishna Bhagwan mentions the word Brahma. Arjun has been hearing this word constantly through seven previous chapters. When it comes to enlightenment, he hears the words Brahmi Stiti. At one point, in one shlok, he heard the word Brahma six times. Brahmarpanam Brahma Havir. So it's natural that he's a little confused about what this Brahm is. And so at the very beginning of chapter 8, Arjun asks Sri Krishna Bhagwan. he says, Kim Tat Brahma, Kim Adhyatmam. What is that Brahma? What is Adhyatma? Adhyatma means spirituality. Now instead of us defining it, Arjun is asking Krishna Bhagwan, tell me what Brahm is, tell me what spirituality is. Now God himself is going to define it. Krishna Bhagavan says, Aksharam Brahma Paramam Swabhavo Dhyatmam Uchyate. Brahm is also known as that Param Akshar Brahm, that ultimate Akshar Brahm. That is Brahm. Brahm with an adjective, Akshar. Sometimes we use the word Akshar on its own, sometimes we use the word Brahm on its own, and sometimes we combine the two words, Akshar Brahm. And then Krishna Bhagavan defines spirituality. He says, Swabhav. Swa in Sanskrit is a pronoun. A pronoun is always linked to the noun before it. So it carries the noun that came before it. The noun that comes before it is Brahma. Swa is equal to Brahma. Swabhav is equal to Brahma Bhav. Brahma Bhav means feeling that you are Brahm, understanding that you are Akshar Brahm, 
You have the virtues of Akshar Brahm. That is Adhyatma. That is spirituality. What is that Akshar Brahm? It's not just a feeling. Bhagwan is going to describe Akshar Brahm as a separate ontological entity. He says, Yad Aksharam Veda Vido Vadanti Vishanti Yad Yatayo Vita Ragaha Yad Ichanto Brahmacharyam Charanti Tate Padam Sangrahena Pravakshe. First, Krishna Bhagwan tells Arjun that this Akshar Brahm has been described in the Vedas. The Vedas are eternal. Thus, Akshar Brahm is automatically eternal. He also says that Akshar Brahm is a place, Padam. On this earth, understanding ourselves to be Akshar Roop, a form of Akshar, is a state of enlightenment. But it's not just a state of enlightenment on earth when we physically pass away. It's a place we go. Vishanti, we enter into this place called Akshar Dham, Akshar Brahm. Both things. You have an experience here on earth, that Esha Brahmi Stiti, but it's also a place you go afterwards to enjoy and be happy forever with God. After this couplet, Bhagwan describes that the word Om means Brahma. In the Vedas, the last section is the philosophical section called the Upanishads. There are ten major Upanishads. One of them is called the Prashna Upanishad. In the fifth question of the Prashna Upanishad, the Guru describes two definitions of the word Om. The Om that we chant, the Om that we meditate upon, the Om that we pray. He says, Etat ve satyakamam param cha aparam cha brahma yad om karaha. There are two Brahms Param Brahm or Parabrahm and Aparam Brahm, a second Brahm, also known as Akshar Brahm. And both of these are described using the word Om. This is not just in the Prashna Upanishad, it's in many different places, including the Chandogya Upanishad. Krishna Bhagwan says the same thing to Arjun here in the Gita. Krishna Bhagwan is using these different terms. Akshar, he also uses the word Purushottam in the Bhagavad Gita. He describes himself as Purushottam who is beyond both Kshar, which is us, and Akshar, which is something separate from us. If we were already naturally Akshar, why would Krishna Bhagwan make two separate categories? In the 15th chapter, and we'll look at this again when we get there. But here Krishna Bhagavan says, Yasmat Ksharam Atit Oham Aksharat Apicha Uttamaha Atosmi Loke Vedecha Pratitaha Purushottama Because Bhagavan is saying, I am beyond Akshar, all things that are destroyed, meaning humans. Because I am beyond that and I am beyond the eternal, undestroyable Akshar, I am beyond even Akshar because of that Ata. In this world, Loke, and in the scriptures, Vede, I am known as Purushota. This is very simple Sanskrit. Bhagwan is telling Arjun that you need to be like Akshar Brahm. Brahma Roop, not Parabrahm Roop. No one becomes like God. And that is the subtle reason why our scriptures usually tell us to become like the devotee. For example, Every traditional recitation of the Ramayana begins with reading the Sundar Kand first. It's not the first chapter. In fact, Ramchandra Bhagwan is the main character, the main hero of every chapter except this one chapter. Because in the Sundar Kand, Hanumanji and Sita Ji are the main characters. The Rushis, the Acharyas, those who set the traditions for the past thousands of years knew that when any spiritual aspirant starts on their progress, on their path, it should be clear, you are not God. You are not going to be like God. You can never be like God. But you can be like His choicest devotee. You have to become like His ideal devotee. In the Gita, in the Upanishads, in the Vedas, in the Brahm Sutras, the term for that ideal devotee is Akshar Brahm. As we discussed before, in Chapter 2, Shlok 7, Arjun tells Krishna Bhagwan, Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava. He's having an emotional overload. Like when you're working in the kitchen and you drop an electric appliance into the sink filled with water, your one plug overloads. But the entire house breaker trips. The entire house loses power, even though only one place had an issue. In the same way, Arjun sees one thing. One emotion takes over and his entire body overloads. His mind shuts down. Everything has just failed. And what does he tell him? I have become a Kruparn, 
Akrupan means I have become an emotional, a spiritual beggar. I am empty inside. Who is Akrupan according to the scriptures, according to Bhagavan? In the Brahadaranik Upanishad, Bhagavan explains, Yova etat aksharam gargi, aviditva, asmat lokat praiti sa krupanaha. Someone who doesn't understand akshar. That person is a spiritual and emotional beggar. Arjun realizes that he's lacking in the virtues of Akshar Brahm. He's not a beggar for money here. His name is Dhananjay, which means he's the one who collects or earns the money. He's lacking in virtues, the virtues of being Brahm. And because of that, he's suffering. And this is the knowledge of both Atma, Akshar, or our soul, and Paramatma, Parabrahm Purushottam, God, together. The problem that we have in our lives is that for some reason, we've made this mistake where we think the temporary has become permanent. We understand this temporary wealth to be our permanent identity. So look how much energy we waste behind it. We understand this temporary body to be our permanent form. Look how much prejudice there is in the world because of it. We understand this temporary location that we call home to be our permanent home. And look how many wars it causes. Duryodhan and Ravan, they didn't understand their true identity. Either way, Duryodhan's low self-esteem caused him to do so many things. And Ravan's too much self-esteem caused him to do too many things. But just as a volcano erupts, it envelops itself, they both cause themselves suffering. All of these diseases of the mind and the soul are removed when we believe that we are like Akshar Brahm and devotees of Purushottam. Aksharam, aham, I am Akshar. Purushottam adasosmi, a devotee of Purushottam. Then if you believe that, you won't get upset if you don't get something you want. Also, you won't get arrogant if you do get what you want. You won't get ego from hearing good things about yourself and you won't get hurt from hearing bad things about yourself. Just as one plant gives many flowers, one wisdom can give many different fruits. In our lives, for some reason, we've become so weak when it comes to handling insults. The slightest sarcastic comment just breaks us. Imagine if a pebble could break down an entire house. How weak is the construction? Imagine if a bird sits on a branch and the branch breaks. How hollow must it be from within? If you put your clothes out to dry in the sun and it fades in just two minutes, how weak must the color be? How weak must our lives be that two words can destroy us? And this isn't just for devotees of God. We see this as a problem across the entire world. This is like a disease. A disease where no matter how many blankets you put on a person, they still feel cold. We have a similar disease. No matter how much we have, we still feel empty inside. New phones, new cars, new homes. And despite getting everything, there's no satisfaction. This is the cure. On the opposite spectrum, even if you had an endless amount of everything you wanted, if you have this, you won't go overboard. Your real nature won't change because you'll never become arrogant or uncontrollable. And that's because you've risen above all your baser natures. Thus, those natures can't change your original nature, what you are as a soul, sat, chit, anan. We are eternal. We are wise. We are full of bliss. You can put peppers in the fridge and they'll get cold, but they'll still be spicy when you take them out. That's its original nature, its true nature. Similarly, our true nature is to be like Brahm, to be full of bliss. Nothing external can change that. In 1987, Mahan Swami Maharaj and many other senior Swamis from the BAPS organization, they traveled to various locations to understand and learn about different exhibitions. They were doing research for the different types of exhibitions to have built in Gandhinagar Akshardham. When they arrived back in Gujarat, they met Pramukh Swami Maharaj in Bochasan. When Pramukh Swami Maharaj heard that they had arrived, Swami Sri left his room, met them outside and started prostrating to them, the Guru started prostrating to his disciples. This is how humble Pramukh Swami was. He welcomed everyone. After some time, they had a meeting. In the meeting, the Swamis all reported to Pramukh Swami the different types of technology they had seen throughout the world. And at the end of the conversation, Pramukh Swami Maharaj told them, he said, I have only one technology, Atma and Paramatma, Akshar and Purushottam, knowledge of the soul and knowledge of God. A similar incident happened in 2007 when Pramukh Swami Maharaj was in Chicago. At that time, a doctor explained to him some new current medical technology where people can swallow a pill and the pill has a camera 
and then that camera can take photos of everything from the inside. Pramukh Swami listened to the entire presentation and then at the end he said, I have only one technology, Atma and Paramatma, Akshar and Purushottam, knowledge of the soul and knowledge of God. In between these two incidents, 20 years had passed. In those 20 years, the entire world had changed over a hundredfold. New technology, new medicine, computers, internet, phones, everything. And despite that, Pramukh Swami Maharaj kept one technology. Something that doesn't change over time. Despite anything outside changing, that's called a principle. His technology is a principle. This is the principle that has been given to us in the Gita for the last 5,000 years. This is the actual wisdom. As we close this lecture, I want to finish with a, an example that Guru Mahan Swami Maharaj gives about what we have here in this body. He says there are three people who are invested in this. The soul is the financial partner, the mind is the managing partner, and the body is the working partner. Of the three, the financial partner should be the one getting the most benefits out of it. And yet, what we see is that the body is taking everything. The employee is stealing everything while the owner is going bankrupt. So as we close today's lecture, let's remember one thing. Arjun's biggest enemy isn't outside of him, it's inside. And the only solution that Krishna Bhagwan over and over gives him is to remind him that you are not this body and you are not all the flaws associated with the body. You are Akshar Brahm. You have those virtues in your life. Understand that. That should be your Swabhav, Brahma Bhav. That is real spirituality. When you imbibe that spirituality, you will arise above the body and you will arise above all the flaws of the body. At the end of this lecture, I also pray that we can imbibe this virtue of understanding our true form to be Akshar Brahm and also understanding our true Dharma to be offering devotion to Parabrahm. Astu. <laughs>